And thanks, so Herman. If I could ask Jeff to, to begin by telling us a little bit about Nasreen, uh, her career as a human rights activist, and how you came to make this documentary about her. Thank you, David. I want to thank the Washington Post, first of all, for hosting this event and for the individual concern that you've all shown for Nazreen personally, but for all the people she represents. Um, and uh, that actually connects to your question. Uh, when we first reached out to Nazreen uh, about doing a documentary about her life and work, uh, there was a trust building process through friends. And uh, one of the things that she shared with us was a strong interest in having her story really be a story about so many others. Um, we had known Nazarene's work for years. And one of the things I loved about Nazarene is um, she's a, a, a Muslim woman who often reached out on behalf of other faiths and other backgrounds uh, to support people in need. And I thought that that was such a powerful message for our own country as well. As a matter of fact, I think everything about Nazarene is a, a powerful message uh, for uh, democracy and mutual respect in, in this country and around the world. Um, so um, when Nazarene said, uh, yes, we could um, do a film with her, we worked out sort of a complicated process. I couldn't go to Iran because of past work I have done, and it wouldn't have made sense to have a big American crew show up in Tehran anyway. So we worked with these really remarkable, talented, and uh, courageous individuals who followed Nazarene around from uh, both working with at-risk uh, clients uh, to protests, to art galleries, theaters, um, bookstores. Um, it was a thrill for us to sort of be there uh, with them, and we're so happy to be able to bring her story to you. Jeff, if, if I could ask, one of the most powerful things about this film is the footage from inside Iran. Did the people who were shooting this footage for you uh, run personal risks? And I worry that some of them may have themselves been subject to arrest uh, or difficulties with the authorities. No one has uh, been subject to arrest or difficulty with authorities because of the film itself, but because they're also activists uh, and believe that their work uh, can push society forward, they have put themselves at occasion uh, at risk for that. Uh, we, Marsha and I, so often throughout the production of this film would say to Nazreen and her husband Reza, um, you know, we will stop at any moment if you feel this puts you or anyone else at risk. That was always our largest concern. We did the whole film in secret, uh, didn't even fundraise in public because we wanted to um, uh, keep as much privacy for them as possible during the process. And even when we were editing, we said to Nazri and Reza, hey, we'll stop now if you think this is a concern. But they felt, um, you know, Nazri has this wonderful quote. She says, our children must not inherit silence. And she'll say over and over again, as do other human rights advocates, that uh, repressive governments they uh, use pressure and force and intimidation to make people quiet. And Nazreen refuses to have her voice muffled. So we are proud that the film can you know, help amplify that voice. Can I share one more Christian. quick thing? Oh. Yes, please. I just want to say that um, well, I got a message from Nazreen's husband this morning. Um, I'd asked uh, if there was a, a message from Nazreen. And he said two things. He said that the cell she's in now, just so you know, is an eight foot by 13 foot cell that has 12 beds in it, bunk beds. Um, and there, it's a low ceiling. There's no windows um, and very little access to clean water. So that's the conditions that she's living in right now. Let me ask uh, Christian. Christian, I think you've interviewed Nasreen in the past, uh, and you've interviewed many other courageous men and women uh, who have taken these risks to stand up for uh, human rights. What is it that motivates a special person like Nasreen in your experience? Well, you know, I'm shaking my head because I'm just so horrified at what her husband Reza has described as her latest terrible conditions inside a, a, a political prison where she's not a political person. And I think this is what also really, for me, has been emblematic of all the human rights defenders who I've interviewed around the world. I haven't had the pleasure of interviewing Nasreen, but I have had the pleasure of interviewing Shirin Ebadi, who, as you remember, also was a human rights lawyer in Iran. She also cannot go back to Iran. She was the first Iranian to win the Nobel Prize. And I covered the stories that she and the cases that, that got her that Nobel Prize. And I know the risk 
that comes with it. And I know that they are not, strictly speaking, party political. And I think this is one thing that came across in Jeff and Marsha's film. And we talked about it when we did the interview. She's not being political. She's not talking about tearing down the regime or wanting you know, any kind of regime change. She's just talking about basic fundamental rights for the people of Iran, mostly in her case, um, women and children, but some young men as well, under their own constitution. It's not like she's going out saying, you know, and, and, and taking cases to court that, are, you know, she's trying to try under Western law or whatever. It's under their own constitution. And this is what makes everybody, and certainly me, so angry that this is what's happened to her, this incredible woman. I think what makes them take those risks, David, is that they truly believe in human rights. They truly believe in um, the dignity of each and every individual. And, and this is important, they truly believe and want to hold their own governments accountable to the promises that those governments made. As I said, Nasreen defends cases based on the Islamic law in Iran, of the Islamic Republic, based on the promises that that regime made to the people 40 years ago um, when the revolution started. And you can see that they've completely reneged on those promises. And that's why people like her are so utterly important. And it, it's heartbreaking, really, to see how somebody like Nasreen, such a dignified, such a quiet, such a human you know, woman with so many feelings and so much emotion, can be treated like some common criminal with no recourse and no rights. It's unacceptable under any um, jurisdiction. And that's why I was so pleased to be able to interview around the film and, and you know, see the sacrifices that she's made. And people should know that, especially for her own family. Her kids, her husband have, have supported her the whole way and it hasn't been easy. Jason, you were imprisoned in the same prison where Nasreen is being held today. As, uh, as Christiane said, the reports from her husband Reza of her conditions are horrifying. You, you've been there. Maybe you could just describe for our audience a little bit of what that prison is like, what it feels like to be there, the, 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 the feelings that, that go through the many, many dozens, hundreds of people who are being held there unjustly. Well, thank you for, for the question, David, and for the opportunity. And, and thank you to all three of you for taking part in this and um, for, for David and Christiane for supporting me uh, and my family while I was locked up in Avene prison, which is a big reason why uh, this film has been so important for me to, to, to get involved with. Um, I think that the, the, the reality of um, the political prisoner system uh, in Iran and Christian makes a very important point. You know, I wasn't a political person either. I was just a reporter doing my job. But our arrests and our detentions are very much uh, politicized events. Um, the the intention of our jailers is to really break us, uh, to uh, make us hopeless, to dissociate ourselves from uh, society. Uh, and and in Nasrin's case, they've failed miserably. I did have the opportunity to uh, to interview Nasreen once uh, in 2013. Uh, it was a couple of months uh, after Hassan Rouhani was elected president, and there was hope that there would be a more moderate uh, attitude from the leadership in Tehran. Uh, and ahead of his first trip to the UNGA, um, they released Nasreen. And uh, my wife and I, who was working for Bloomberg at the time, uh, visited Reza and Nasreen and their children in their home on that very first day that she was released. And although she was relieved and happy to be back with her family, she made it clear that she was not at all satisfied that she had been released because so many of her colleagues and friends and other innocent people were being held in, in prison. Uh, and I think uh, for someone like her, uh, I imagine one of the most frustrating things about her experience would be that she understands uh, the laws that she is trying to uphold much better than the people who are implementing them and using them against her. Uh, and I think that uh, for that reason, uh, she's an incredible example and hero uh, to so many. I, I hope, uh, Jason, as I, I know we all do, that, uh, that Nasreen's husband, Reza, will tell her 
that today in America, many thousands of people were thinking about her, uh, watching little bits of her story. Let's take a look at another clip uh, from Jeff Kaufman's uh, film, if we can roll that, and then Jeff, I'll, I'll ask you to comment on it. حدود ده سال پیش که کمپین یک میلیون امضا برای تغییر تبعیض آمیز قوانین در واقع این برای برابری زنان در ایران فعالیت کرد یه دفتری داشت زیر زمینی بود در همین خیابون سلیمان قاتل ما اونجا خیلی وقتا جمع می شدیم تصمیم می گرفتیم راجب موضوعاتی که با اونا مواجه می شدیم خوب بود یه تعداد خانم اومدن جمع شدن در اعتراض به قوانین تبعیزامیز کمپین یک میلیون امضا رو تشکیل دادن مطابق اون داشتن امضا جمع آوری میکردن که ببرن بدن به مجلس قانون گذاری بگن و قوانین مربوط به زنان رو تغییر بدید اما یک به یکی اومدن اینا رو بازداشت کردن بردن احکام سنگین سادر کرد خیلی به زندان افیم نفتاده بودن So Jeff, tell us a little bit more about the one signatures campaign that was described in that uh, little piece of film and what role it plays today in the women's and human rights activist movements in Iran. Of course. First of all, I just have to note, um, and it's easy to miss in passing, Nazreen is not wearing a headscarf while she's driving her car. And that would mean that she could be subject to 10 years in prison just for that very act. Uh, the defiance seems so small, and yet it's just so remarkably big. And um, I think one of the things I find moving about the entire women's rights movement in Iran, and specifically uh, the One Million Signatures campaign, which, as Christiane was saying, was an effort to use the law, the actual laws in Iran, to uh, to um, to address uh, inequities for women in that country, which are grave, uh, but out of respect for the law, not trying to tear things down, to build things properly. Uh, we made this film uh, during a time when democracy was under assault in our country. Uh, and yet here you see these women um, who um, believe in grassroots democracy and believe in, in, in the rule of law and are trying to get a million signatures from men and women. Uh, and they have many male allies in the process to uh, systematically address inequities in the Iranian law uh, and make it a more just society. Uh, so uh, both for them and as an example, but also uh, as a reminder of what's going on in our country, I, I find their work just incredibly moving. And it also just again shows the resilience, not just of Nazreen, but of just countless women who need to be respected in that society. Christian, if I remember correctly, you lived in Iran as a young girl. Uh, you remember Iran before the 1979 revolution. Uh, maybe you could share with us a, a picture of the arc of, of women's rights, women's struggle for justice over that long uh, course of Iran's modern history. Well, yes, I lived in Iran and I grew up in Iran. My father was Iranian um, until, until the revolution with a little bit of schooling abroad, but until the 1979 revolution. So of course there was a very pronounced class structure. There were very serious socioeconomic divisions. But on the whole, the Shah actually did bring rights to women, um, legal rights to women. Women could work, women could go to you know, college, school, all of that stuff. Um, when, the, when the Ayatollahs came in, what happened was that their legal rights were taken away. In other words, you know, when it came to property rights, when it came to custody rights, divorce law rights, inheritance rights, all of that, women took a second, third, and fourth class position. 
And that's why women's activists in Iran have been so very important over the last 40 years since the Islamic Revolution. And women historically in Iran have played a vital role, and this is really important to understand. They're not shy, blushing, you know, fragile flowers who, who, who don't speak their mind. As you can see from Nasreen, women in Iran are on the forefront of so much of the political change, the human rights change, uh, the legal change, and indeed reform when, whenever it's visible in Iran. Women are on the front lines. And so it's quite humbling to see the bravery with which people like Nasreen and all the other names you showed in that, uh, that she was talking about in that clip. And as I said, Shirin Ebadi, who was the first Nobel Prize winner, um, she won a, a case you know, that was to do with custody. And the custody was automatically given to a father, and the child, a young daughter, literally was killed in the father's custody. And that changed the law um, in Iran. So these were, were, were very big deals. Um, and I just think that, you know, it, it, I, I want everybody to understand that Iranian women are the backbone of that country. There's no doubt about it. They really, really are. Unlike women in many parts of the Islamic world, the Iranian women have been very strong, very mobilized, very much part of, of society, as you can see. You know, Nasreen and Shireen and the others don't just emerge out of nowhere. It's a long, long tradition. And I think it's great that Jeff is showing this, and I think it's great that the world needs to understand this. And if I might just say also, you know, the first female to win a Fields Mathematics um, medal was um, an Iranian-American. So there's a huge amount of, of success by Iranian women around the world. And that's why I think it's really important to show what Iranian women are trying to do for their own girls and women and for their rights uh, in their own country. And, and what an incredible hard, hard job it is and how much personal risk they take. And I also want to pay tribute to the journalists, as Jeff said. If, at the beginning of the of the film, he says, "I pay tribute to all the you know the camera people and the and the crews who I cannot name." He explained why. But it's really important to understand that this story is being told despite the massive crackdowns, and I think that's that's fantastic. Christiana, I want to just stay with you for a moment to ask you briefly. Just recently. A Saudi woman, uh, human rights activist, Bujain al Hafloul, was released from prison. And I'm wondering whether you, as a journalist, see a broader movement among women in, in the Middle East, in Iran certainly, but, but perhaps in other countries as well, to try to bring pressure for greater rights. Do you know, I actually do, and I've spent a lot of my career in the field actually focusing a lot on the women's movements. It just was organic. I'm a woman. I guess I gravitated uh, to those kinds of stories, but they were real. I didn't have to look for them, or, or they're not tokens. They're absolutely front and center of so many of these countries. And so many of these nations, my country, Iran, uh, Saudi Arabia, across the Middle East, they're, the majority of the population are young people. Um, whether it's boys and girls. But in Iran, for instance, women make up the majority of university students. That's a fact. They do. And they do really, really well. And Saudi Arabia is a perfect case. It's a perfect case study because it is the women in Saudi Arabia who have been on the front lines of the human rights and reform activism, whether it's for driving, whether it's for the freedom of expression, um, whatever it might be. And, and I had the opportunity to talk to um, Lujain al hathrul's sister, because she still is not allowed to talk. She was released, but she is not free from jail in that she's not allowed to move. Her, her, you know, her movements are restricted. She can't speak publicly. But these women have been so brave. Imagine that Lujain was put in jail by the same crown prince who endeared himself to the West by advocating and proposing reform for women, women's ability to drive, women getting a bigger part in society. And then he goes and puts the, the female activists in jail. So it's not just in, in the Middle East either. It's in Africa. It's all over the place where we see women, even in, in Myanmar right now, you see women front and center with the others confronting a very tough military junta who will open on them with live fire. So I think it's a very important moment right now to, to, to really focus on what these women are doing for their nations. So, uh, Jeff, I want to ask you about one of the really moving parts of this 
film, and, and that's the footage of Nasreen's husband, Reza, uh, who has stood by her uh, unflinchingly, supporting her, uh, believing in her. Um, he, he seems like a remarkable person. The fact that you were in touch with him today is especially moving to me. Tell, tell our audience a little bit about, about uh, Reza, Nasreen's husband, and, and why he's been such a supporter of his wife's cause and commitment. Uh, I will. And I'm so glad you asked. Um, and one of the reasons we wanted to do this film, besides profiling Nasreen, was because we wanted to um, fight back on the demonization of Iran and the demonization of Islam that is being used too often for political purposes in this country. And no one has a better way to do that than Nasreen and, and Reza. Uh, my partner, Marsha Ross, the producer of this documentary, called uh, Reza Condon, who's Nasreen's husband, uh, Nasreen's Marty Ginsburg. In other words, uh, if if you think of the way Marty Ginsburg supported uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg with such uh, adoration and support, but was her equal intellectually and in the law, that's very much the relationship between Nazarene uh, and, and Reza. Uh, he's someone who um, they met because they were both uh, working for a journal years ago that was called The Gate, trying to create communication about human rights uh, in Iran. And uh, he's been at her side ever since. Um, a few months after she was arrested in June 2018, Reza himself was arrested in prison, and he keeps advocating on her behalf, but he has a six-year prison sentence hanging over his head. They have that hanging over his head to keep him silent, but like his wife, um, he refuses to be silent. Jason, let me ask you whether the example of Courageous women like Nasreen, like Shireen Abadi, the other people that we've described, is having an effect on Iranian men and, and their attitudes as, as they see these brave women, I'm assuming that some of the stereotypes that they may have, have had are beginning to change. Is that right? Yeah, it is. I, and it's a great question, David. I think uh, the last few years in particular, there's been a big shift. Um, you know, it's a um, a male-dominated society uh, legally, uh, but as Chris Young pointed out, women are the backbone of that culture uh, and, and have been going back for years. Iran in the last few months has been facing its own uh, Me Too moment with a lot of very prominent men being um, implicated in, in, in sexual harassment and abuse cases. Um, and this was the sort of thing that several years back women would, would not likely uh, be able to get any traction with. But very suddenly, uh, with the support of, uh, of, of more and more men, uh, you know, this is something that, that is able to be talked about in society. And I think um, there is a, a, a blossoming happening uh, in a society that, frankly, has been very uh, macho uh, for, for, for many centuries in a lot of ways. But uh, I'm, I'm hopeful, and it's one more reason that I'm, I'm sad that I'm not able to go to Iran anymore, because I would like to see this, this blossoming happening and this change in terms of men supporting women. Uh, it, it's a fact, uh, as Christian pointed out, that women make up the vast majority, not, excuse me, not the vast majority, but the majority of university students. Uh, and as you go higher and higher up educational rungs, uh, women are, are, are more often the students than men. There are more women in the workplace than there ever have been before. So it's quite natural, uh, I think, that, that uh, they should expect uh, the same rights, equal pay, um, and same opportunities as men. And I feel as though more and more men in Iran are finally coming around to that, that understanding. Christian, like me, you as a journalist have watched the ebb and flow of U.S. Iran relations for several decades now. We're entering a new cycle with the Biden administration saying that it, it's ready to resume negotiations with Iran uh, over the nuclear issue and other issues. How do you think that dialogue should proceed? And in particular, is there, there a way to put human rights issues, the issues of people like Nasreen, more squarely in the center of that story? I wish there was, and you know, again, Shirin Ebadi used to say, if only the West would approach the approach Iran on a human rights basis rather than, you know, the other ways, it might have it, it might have made a, a difference. And I just want to note that the first ever 
human rights document was delivered by Cyrus the Great 2,500 years ago, an Iranian emperor, emperor who you know, freed the Jews from Babylon, allowed them to rebuild their temple and became a real human rights champion. And his cylinder did a tour of the United States um, several years ago. I just want to remember that you know, we were doing human rights before it was even you know, a speck in anybody's eye. And we need to get back to that. Iran needs to get back to that and to respect it. I believe personally, and I'm speaking as a person now, not as a CNN or whatever, that they have to get back to this Iran nuclear deal because is it, as we've been told as journalists um, and as you know, people all over the world that the biggest threat is the Iran nuclear program. Well, there was a deal to constrain it. Um, the United States uh, it came out of that deal, was in contravention of that deal, and now they need to go back into that deal. As painful as it might be, they need to go back into that deal and not argue about who goes first and, and whatnot, and then try to build on the other legitimate uh, challenges that the West has with Iran, human rights, um, support for you know, you know, militants around the world um, and, and all the other things that you know, they, they want to talk about. But it seems to me that to miss an opportunity to go back into that deal would, would put yet another big problem on the world's plate. We don't want to see nuclear proliferation, so we need that deal to constrain that. So, uh, Jeff, I want to uh, focus a little bit more on the question of what the United States can do to, to help. Uh, President Biden, uh, last year when he was a candidate, uh, wrote in an op-ed about Nasreen so today and her case. Uh, now he's in the White House. What would you like to see um, President Biden and other members of his administration do specifically? Is there a way that they can help and, and make this case more of an issue and, and bring some pressure uh, on the regime to uh, reduce her sentence or get her out of prison? Yeah, it's always easier to campaign than to actually govern. Uh, but I think the principles that the Biden administration expressed during the campaign, and they've expressed since, um, still hold. And um, I'm a strong believer in the nuclear accord, but um, I also, I, I'm sorry, I just lost everybody. Can you still see me? Yeah. I'll keep talking as if you're there. Um, so, sorry. Um, I still believe that, that, that um, we can um, do more than one thing at a time, and that we can advance the nuclear accord uh, and use that as a way also to finally reestablish some credibility for this country um, on that level, and then use that as a way to advance human rights as well. The two don't have to be separate, uh, but they're both built on credibility, communication, uh, and certain uh, standards that serve both countries. Um, again, I can't tell if I'm still with you, so um, if you could Jeff, send you, me. You, yeah. you are. Sure. I, I, you're, I think we're, we're seeing you, and I've, I've been just been sent a message that you may have a message yeah. from Nasreen that you can share with us. Is that so? Sure. Yes, I do. And, and I'm sorry for the brief technical glitch. Um, I think this film is, is an example that uh, you know we can uh, overcome obstacles from great distances and even technological uh, limitations, but sometimes it's difficult. Um, I asked uh, Reza Nazreen's husband if Nazreen had any message to share for this conversation, um, and I got a note from him this morning. And uh, these are Nazreen's words uh, through Reza. And uh, Nazreen said, what occupies my thoughts the most is those who are on death row here in Garchak prison. Right now, there are 17 women on death row facing imminent execution. And she closed by saying, I'm hoping for an end to the death penalty across the world. So, you know, there's Nazreen uh, facing uh, enormous pressure and difficulties, but as usual, she's not thinking about herself, she's thinking about others, and she's trying to push her country forward. That's very powerful uh, to, to hear from this remarkable woman, words that she sent today. Jason, let me ask you, as someone who was imprisoned unjustly, whose cause was taken up by your newspaper and by many, many thousands of Americans, what difference you think that public pressure from the United States, from world public opinion made in your ultimately being released? So I, I think it made a huge amount of difference in, in my case. Um, and, and oftentimes 
when we're talking about foreign nationals being held hostage uh, in Iran, um, usually they're dual nationals, and you know Iran tries to suppress this information uh, of our second nationality as much as possible. For me, it became clear as my case was being brought up more and more, uh, my treatment uh, by my captors got better and better. Uh, and I realized at some point uh, during the, the process of, of going on uh, on trial in Iran's revolutionary court, and I don't think I need to tell anybody that's in the conversation with me, but maybe some folks at home listening should know that if you ever find yourself on trial with in a court with, with revolutionary in its name, uh, you don't have a good chance of winning. Uh, but I realized that, that my real case was in the case of international public opinion. And, um, and the more people kind of pushed um, for, for my release, the more involved the U.S. government got. Uh, and so much of that started uh, first and foremost with, with my family. Uh, very early on in, uh, in my imprisonment, my mom went on Christian's show uh, and, and, and talked about my situation. Uh, and, and, and our colleagues at the Washington Post, uh, who didn't let a day go by uh, without raising my case. Uh, so now, you know, when I'm contacted by uh, the families of, of people uh, who, who are being held in prison in Iran, uh, unfortunately, there's five of them, uh, five Americans being held at this very moment, I'm in touch with every one of those families. And I tell each one of them, make as much noise as you possibly can. Uh, and when your loved one gets out, uh, they will thank you for it. And, and time and again, when people have been released uh, that I've written about, they contact me and say, you know, thank you for, uh, for, for making sure that I wasn't forgotten about. And my attitude is, you know, what kind of hypocrite would I be if after getting all of the support that I got, uh, that, I, that I didn't pay it forward by, by helping people who've been, uh, had, had their voices silenced. Well, I, I hope we made a little noise today on Nasreen's behalf. We're unfortunately out of time, but I want to close by thanking our guests, Christian Amanpour from CNN, uh, Jeff Kaufman in particular, who made this extraordinary film, uh, and my colleague, Jason Rezaian. The, you can watch Nasreen, uh, this powerful, upsetting film, in the USA and Canada, now on demand. International audiences can stream the film starting in a week on March 8. Thank you for being with us, for in watching this, bearing witness to the, the suffering and difficulty of Nasreen. Uh, thanks to all of our guests and all of you for watching. We'll be back tomorrow. Jonathan Capehart uh, with uh, an interview with restaurant guru Danny Meyer. <laughs>